Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. I want to thank you for carving time out of your Monday afternoon to join us today. Today's webinar, our educational topic call series, is one of a monthly series of webinars designed to bring information of a practical nature to people living with ALS. We have a wonderful guest speaker this afternoon. You know, as we turn into September and the, the fall season comes to at least a portion of the country, it seems like we spend more time in our homes and we're looking forward to some of the end of the year holidays or um, opportunities to gather together. So this month we have a guest that has expertise in both nutrition and dining. Dr. Reva Barwell is a dentist specializing in prosthodontics. She is a scientific researcher, a French culinary chef, and founder of Savor Ease, a company that researches and develops foods that address the challenges associated with dysphagia. While the ALS Association does not endorse any specific product, service, or treatment, we are pleased to have guest speakers with expertise serving the ALS community share information related to the challenges so commonly experienced during a journey with ALS. Dr. Bawa, I believe you are on our call already. I will mention one housekeeping note. Would you kindly submit your questions or comments to the chat box so that we can have the opportunity to share those with, with all who have logged on after Dr. Barwell's presentation during our Q&A segment. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Barwell. Yes. Um, hi there. Um, thank you so much, Cynthia, for inviting me to speak today um, to the ALS Association about a topic that uh, is dear to my heart, and uh, I hope that it helps a lot of people um, with ALS. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an evocative picture that was printed alongside a New York Times article written by Elizabeth Jameson. She's an author, artist, and person with progressive multiple sclerosis. The title of her story was, I Never Stop Lusting for a Good Bite. So the emotional language and imagery is really clear here. And she describes in her story, her changed relationship with the eating experience um, and I'm going to share a little bit of this with you today. So as Cynthia said, uh, I am a dentist that specializes in oral complex needs, but spent most of my childhood in and out of dental offices because I was born with a bone development issue and led to problems with chewing. At the same time, I am a trained French culinary chef and I ultimately felt I could do more good helping people eating than making the food itself. But recently I've changed my mind and I'm now doing both. I spent many years in research and food development as I worked on better choices for people with dysphagia. As Cynthia said, I'm the founder of Savory's Foods and I wanna tell you something, I am not an expert on ALS, but I think I'm gonna bring you a different fresh perspective that you might not have heard before. I know a lot about the mouth, I know a lot about food, and I know about difficulty swallowing. Right here is my contact information. That's my email, rbearwall at savories.com. Please feel free to contact me for more information, or you can get it from my website at www.savories.com. So here are some more words from Elizabeth's article. She had some insightful quotes that I wanted to share with you. I wish I could be caught with a guilty mouthful of chips and an unhealthy soda. People often forget about the fact that I need to eat or drink. When I read this, I realized that Elizabeth is communicating on the loss of eating independence and the secret joys that are lost when you cannot use your hands or have difficulty swallowing. Today, what I want to do is explore why we eat 
and how our relationship to food changes with serious illness. Then we'll find out steps we can take to optimize the dining experience. This is a term I call dining health, and I'll address how snacking is underutilized and how it can play a bigger role to optimize dining health. I'll show you how to bring back fun into the kitchen and not all, for, for everyone, for the caregiver and their loved one without sacrificing nutrition or safety. So let's dig in. Um, in health, we can break down the reasons we eat into two broad categories, the emotional component and the physical need for nutrition. If you only focus on nutrition and don't optimize the emotional reasons for eating, then the risk is lack of interest in food, which we all know can have serious consequences. Let's talk a little bit about the emotional component. Our association with food is complex and deeply rooted in family history and culture. Food is how many of us show love. It's a creative expression. It can symbolize the change of seasons like Cynthia had mentioned. Um, we are now approaching fall and foods describe this change of season. It can be tied to our religion or our beliefs. It becomes our identity. If you just stand behind someone at Starbucks and hear them use 10 adjectives before they actually use the word coffee, you can tell that you can have a coffee identity. So this list, in a sense, describes our food identity. Everyone is different. If we learn what people eat, we begin to know who they are. There are other reasons we choose food. But my emphasis here is that there is a strong emotional component to our food choices. Now, what I want to share is that with ALS, the balance shifts. It changes the emphasis. And we move from the emotional priorities towards the nutritional needs. It is vitally important to talk about the food we need to maintain the calories and protein and the textures that can be safely swallowed, how to position ourselves for safer swallowing, when it's important to use a feeding tube, the modifications we need in the kitchen and at the table to be able to eat. These are all guides for optimizing nutrition. So the conversation around food shifts to survival. So, Here again is some, are some quotes from Elizabeth. And I feel that people with ALS and their caregivers need to absolutely learn all of the nutritional challenges, but we are all human beings and operate on an emotional level for most of our decision-making. When we are tossed into this new landscape that is based on new rules, new language and restrictions, the emotions can change. Elizabeth says, my approach to how and when I eat has had to change because now there's always a witness to my crime. Food means so much to me. With each dining situation, there's also a confluence of emotions, often mutual discomfort or frustration. So, Jan Pryor is an SLP at University of Washington and she shared this slide with me. Her study is on the psychological effects of dysphagia as it relates to the dining experience. Now, as you can see, these findings and the comments made by Elizabeth are in alignment. So let's just go through it a little bit. The progression here shows that when something changes in the body structure or function, there's a psychological response and added barriers and facilitators. That's something that we're talking about in this slide is dysphagia. The result is eating and drinking changes, right? But not only that, she describes here in this, um, using this example from Martino in 2008, is that there is a social 
change as well. Eating meals together changes. And the emotions that are now reported with all of these changes described are, are pretty heavy. They're fear, depression, embarrassment, control, frustration, vulnerability, and the need for emotional support. So as I was thinking about this, you know, what, what I really like about this topic is that I can pull from multiple resources. And Joy Selden is an author on emotional intelligence. And she describes emotions as having a purpose. And I linked it to this problem that we're faced with. Because if the emotions people are feeling are negative towards the dining experience, as mentioned before, then eating becomes a chore. So what she says is the purpose is to prompt you to action that is ultimately beneficial for survival and well-being. That is the purpose of emotions. Emotions communicate through your body, direct you to different types of action, to move you away from harm, pain, or towards pleasure, creativity, and fulfillment. So when we look at what, what's happening with dysphagia, your logical side says you need to eat for survival, and your emotional side is pulling you away from eating. Another adaptation is that our food authorities shift, right? Our recommendation usually in the past came from television, like the Food Network channel, um, which is a, an all-time American favorite, uh, friends, family, magazines, cookbooks, and now the shift is more from a clinical team and a focus is back to the prevention of weight loss, which is so important. And this team is highly trained and collaborative, right? Your physician and nurse coordinates your care. The occupational therapist determines the need for assistive devices for eating and drinking. They offer tools and techniques to grip utensils and assist with eating. Um, your SLP or speech and language pathologist does a swallow evaluation. They determine food texture modification and eating techniques. Your dietitian uh, determines the calorie, protein, and fluid needs and provides dietary suggestions. And I wear a white coat as well. And this team is critical to meet your nutritional goals. I can't give you advice today or any day on what the right tool is to use for feeding or guide on dysphagia diagnosis. But what I can relay is that if one of the biggest issues surrounding eating is desire and enjoyment, focusing on this as well really can complete the picture. So the next slide I have is um, a person that I re highly respect. Her name is Nancy Hogue. She's a registered nurse that has spent over a decade in a multidisciplinary ALS clinic here in Portland, Oregon. And she's talking about her experiences with the delicate balance. Now the, the video might, the audio might lag with the video, but we're gonna give it our best shot here. I'm a registered nurse and I um, have worked for many years with um, ALS patients. And ALS is an all encompassing complex disease. So when they come to clinic, they see a full multidisciplinary team, um, including a registered dietitian and a speech language pathologist. And um, ALS patients have difficulty speaking and swallowing and chewing. Um, it also takes a lot of work to eat. And these patients can be very fatigued. They can also have respiratory weakness. So it's, it's harder to breathe and eat at the same time. So there are a lot of issues and they can also be hypermetabolic, which means that they're burning calories like crazy. And how do we keep their weight on? Because weight loss is associated with a poor um, outcome in ALS. So we bring these patients in and we look at everything we can do to increase their nutritional intake. We want them to have calories. Um, so we have many things to address with ALS patients, but two top priorities include safety and quality of life. Great, I hope everyone was able to hear that. Um, I'm a registered. So what I'm gonna suggest now is that we talk a little bit about this weight loss because when it happens, 
we focus on the nutritional aspects, but I want to talk more about the food enjoyment, which directly relates to quality of life that Nancy had mentioned. And enjoyment is that missing piece. It speaks to the emotional reasons we eat. And I believe that after all, where we eat, with whom we eat and, and when we eat might be equally, if not more important in determining how much we eat than the food itself. So what I wanted to do today is not focus on the physical challenges, but really focus on that enjoyment piece to help increase appetite. And I'm gonna give you some solutions um, to help rebuild our emotional connection to food. So what, I, what I'm gonna say is that this, this term, this concept is termed dining health. Um, and dining health is a person-centered approach that brings our previous relationship with food into our current state of being. So it, it really refers to the dining environment we create to improve the eating experience. And this is like, this is, a, this is right out of a recent expert review. And they're talking about improvement in the texture modified foods or soft food diet associated with dysphagia. Um, dysphagia, I'm, I'm just gonna make sure I define that as difficulty swallowing. And you can see here that the table is turning, so to speak. Um, we are understanding more the importance of variety, having choice as a powerful tool for improving food enjoyment. Um, we are looking at the environment for eating and the aesthetic appeal of food to increase the desire to eat. Although this whole study was really focused on facility care, we can definitely adopt for home care. You know, they talk about increasing the food attractiveness, increasing diversity, and offering a range of alternative meal choices, providing tailored support, the quiet environment, more finger foods, more variety, and enhancing your ingredients with protein or extra calories. So um, these are all concrete solutions. And I'm going to show you how to implement these best practices at home. And I'm gonna create suggestions for you that takes research from food science, di dietetics, psychology, and speech and language pathology, but distill it down to what I think is important to the topic. So um, there are four, four components that we're gonna talk about today on dining health. Uh, the, um, the number one is build engagement. The number two is appeal to the senses. Three, increase frequency of eating, and four, make it social. So in this slide here, we have build engagement, and really the focus here is communication. So if we talk about the foods that we will serve beforehand, like let's just talk about the ingredients, where the food came from, the flavors, um, talk about the seasons again, how, even if it was pre-prepared foods, where they were made and what's in them, even if they can't engage in, chew, in, the, in the actual cooking, it will increase expectation for a positive food experience. And this is really referred in a study which showed that if one expects the food to be good through communication, then the rating of the food is going to be higher. I actually witnessed an event in a nursing home where a nurse, a, a CNA, she really didn't say positive words with regards to the puree diet that she was serving. And you could actually see the emotional negative response in the individual because no one wants to eat food that someone else does not want to eat. So if we can actually um, talk about the meal um, and use positive words, we can improve um, our response to the food before we actually put the food in our mouth. So I'm gonna bring up next a famous study on the power that this brings. Like we are really gonna put emphasis on our mind to lead to a physical change. And I want us to try a little exercise together. So what you see here 
is a lemon. And I want you to look at this picture of this lemon, the juice running from this lemon, the, the, the smell of this lemon. Can you smell it? Can you smell the, the scent of the, the citrus? And if you bit into this lemon, it would burst flavor in your mouth the juices would run down your chin. Now I'm gonna ask you if your mouth started to water a little bit. Did your mouth start to pucker a little bit? What happened in there? So you can see that through communication and visualization, you can create a physical positive response to your food before you even eat it. So there's also another part of building engagement, and this is called the pre-preparatory phase of eating, and that's too much language. So I'm just going to call it building engagement, setting the scene. Can, can we put something on our table to mark the seasons? I, I particularly love the fall because it reminds me of fall flavors like cinnamon and pumpkin and roasted peppers. And we can actually at, bring some of the fall elements into onto our table um, through decoration. And the environment then can give us, a, a, there's a component to the environment that we can capitalize there. And that's the perception of variety. Seasons provide a variety change and it can change the eating environment. So you don't always have to change the foods to change the environment or set the scene. So another thing here, this is an Italian restaurant, right? There's a perception of ethnicity here. Um, you can see it in the checkered tablecloth. You see the spaghetti, the noodles that are there, the tomatoes, they are creating a scene. So it gets you ready to having an Italian meal. You can actually make subtle changes at home. You can put a red checkered tablecloth for Italian night and have fun with it. You know, perhaps you can play Italian music on low, perhaps like a, a low volume. You can change that situation to make it feel different. Um, so you're not just relying on the food itself for those cues. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're improving the mood for both of you. You're creating like a new positive memory. There's also a really interesting study. If you're focused on, you know, these meals and you're saying, well, now I have to make an Italian meal and a different ethnic variety meals. There's one little nugget that I can share. And um, this group, Bella and Panician did a study. And all I did was change the sauce but they left the main components the same and they changed the names of the sauces they 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 called them different ethnic names and they found that the sauce was the most important feature in a meal to identify that meal as being a different ethnic type meal or not even ethnic but it it actually creates what that meal is going to be like, um, more so than the food underlying that sauce, if that makes sense. So I am going to talk about our senses next. Um, Dr. BJ Miller is a physician at Zen Hospice House. He spoke at a TED talk about tending to dignity by way of the senses. He said, probably the most poignant room in the Zen hospice guest house is our kitchen, which is a little strange when you realize that so many of our residents can eat very little, if anything at all. But we realize we are providing sustenance on several levels, smell, a symbolic plane. Seriously, with all the heavy duty stuff happening under our roof, one of the most tried and true interventions we know of is to bake cookies. As long as we have our senses, we have at least the possibility of accessing what makes us feel human and connected. Primal sensorial delights that say the things we don't have words for, impulses that make us stay present, 
no need for a past or a future. So I don't know about you, but forget about that lemon. Let's close our eyes and taste a chocolate chip cookie together. This the, They look amazing. And I can see how smell can be so provocative. And how can we use this in our home? So senses are not affected by ALS. We all know that the, there is strength in this and you can perceive and evaluate food through engagement of your senses. It, it will prepare you for the eating experience. Vision, taste, hearing, touch, and smell. And you can see here that if you wanted to rate all of these senses, you would say that appearance is the number one driver for putting food in our mouths. The color of the food, the shape, the volume, these are all really important. This is actually a plate of um, pureed salmon and vegetables that have all been molded to give them extra height. So, the baked cookies idea at Zen Hospice House might have come, I think, from that mall experience that I think we might have all had as an experience when you smell that waft of baked cookies from Mrs. Fields. Um, and, I, and I kind of extrapolate from that and I say, well, can we all think of great smells in our kitchen that make everyone sniff their way to the table? Um, you know, in, an, in that earlier slide where we were talking about building engagement, um, there was a man who was cooking and the woman was in the background smelling basil. And I really think this is powerful because if you can use flavor memory, it can be a power, powerful preparer for us to eat. And she doesn't even probably know she's preparing herself for the meal, even if she's not cooking the meal. So I would ask if it's possible to have your loved one with ALS sit near the kitchen to smell the aromas and anticipate. So Dr. Lisa Dweezer, who is a really well-known food scientist in this space, um, and she has studied a lot in long-term care, and she shared that puree foods will have a different flavor profile because of the volatiles that are released when we process the food. So sh her suggestion is to add more aromatics to your food um, because when you puree, you release those aromatics in the kitchen. And when it comes to the table, it might be dulled. So you have to enhance your foods. Um, and it doesn't happen that way with solid foods because when you put a solid food in your mouth, those volatile compounds actually are released in the mouth and you get that flavor from them. So you get better perception of smell and taste. So try using more spices, more seasonings, more citrus and more herbs to kind of enhance things a little bit more than what you used to use. Another thing about um, appealing to the senses is of course taste, right? Um, the real great thing to do to create more flavor is to pair opposing flavors together. together. Um, puree also has that um, dilutive quality that we talked about. So we really need to enhance the flavor but pair opposing flavors as well. Um, the other real key tip here is that stronger flavors can be easier to swallow than bland ones. And the other little tip that I want to share with you is that be mindful that puree has been shown to have up to 50% less protein than non-pureed foods. So think about this when you need to dilute to create a puree. Use bone broth if possible and enhance um, with protein powders. You can buy these in the store. Um, we talked about adding herb seasonings to enhance the taste. Another little um, cue is the temperature of the food. Hot or cold foods are generally easier to swallow than lukewarm or room temperature food. The other a little nugget is carbonated beverages can improve the swallow function. So those are just some topics that are, um, some tips that are a little bit off topic, but I thought would be useful for you. Let's talk a little bit about hearing. Um, 
So back to being in the kitchen, there is value to being at home for many different reasons than being in a facility because at home, where you eat and where you cook are usually really close together and you can hear the food being prepared. You can smell it, you can see it. It This prepares us to eat. So, you know, this this whole thinking is why restaurants are moving more to an open kitchen. It truly is a sensorial delight, a cur like a curiosity to see your cook you know, I, I don't know if you've been to those Japanese restaurants where they do all those tricks. Well, despite the tricks, you're actually watching them prepare and you're hearing, you're communicating with them about the food. And it totally makes that dining experience into almost theater, right? Um, so try to just ha have your loved one close to the kitchen so they can enjoy some of that process. Um, the other little thing about hearing is music. Um, it's another element. We have to be careful about that music. The tempo should be slow and the volume soft when you're eating. But why do fast, like it just really is again derived from restaurants and what we know about sensory, food sensory in restaurants. If you go to a fast food restaurant, they're gonna have louder music, more energetic, more rapid tempo. And if you go to a fine dining restaurant, it's completely the opposite. It, you know, the fine dining, the mood is softer, the volume is softer, and you wanna encourage people to take their time to enjoy their food. And so if you want to increase time enjoying eating at home, use that little tidbit to um, play some music that is music that people enjoy, that your loved one and you both enjoy. And because the eating time might take longer, it might be slower to eat, that music will encourage that positive eating atmosphere. I'm gonna talk about a traditional meal plan um, that um, really has the focus on getting the calories from breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You see the snack option at the bottom there. You'll get a nice total calories for the day of 1,700 to 2,100. But I'm going to ask you, if your loved one eats everything that you put on the plate, some days there might be more fatigue, which affects your appetite. And there's also something called eating fatigue. You just get tired as you're eating. And I think Nancy referred to this as well. Sometimes in the morning after a difficult night, they might not be ready for this type of breakfast. Now, plate waste is actually a really big issue in nursing homes where it can approach 60% of the meal served. And here's another asset to people living at home because I feel that you won't have as much plate waste. You can be responsive to the changes. Um, there's no studies to really prove this, but you can tell me what you see at home. And just keep in mind one key point, that there is no nutrition in food not eaten. So if you're not eating the food, you're not getting that 2,100 calories, and it could be part of the reason why we're experiencing weight loss despite having a calorie dense and protein dense meal plan. So here's my version of the updated meal plan that takes into account new research that's come out. We've made the main meals a little smaller and ensured that the snacks are high in calories and potentially high in protein. And you should fortify any chance you can get with protein, like the smoothie, for example. Um, bean, beans are actually great uh, for people with ALS. And um, so they make a really healthy snack if you can make them into a dip. So what I've done here is I've gone from three larger meals to more equally distributed six meals a day. The snacks have the benefit they can be eaten slowly and don't necessarily have to be eaten in the dining room. And changing that frequency of eating, going from three to six, can actually improve dining health. So, you know, your, your SLP will let you know what texture is appropriate here. We're not gonna really go into all of those details, 
But one thing I can share with you is that every SLP will tell you that you want to go to the least restrictive texture you safely can eat at all times. So if that texture is more of a soft food texture, you stick to that. If it's minced moist, you stick to that and try not to go to a puree diet because you want to encourage um, those, those things that I talked about, the flavors that can come out of foods when they're not at that puree level for as long as you can. So this idea of, um, you know, increasing the opportunities to eat from three times to five to six times a day is really based on literature. And it supports that slow eating and grazing with snacking. Um, and the literature really says, do introduce snacks because the result is we can increase our overall daily consumption of food. We can increase body weight. And in hospitals, they showed that it can reduce the length of stay. We also know that it can support that eating independence. On the previous slide, actually, I use I shared a resource. It was iddsi.org. I'm going to go back to that. It's on the bottom right hand side of that screen. And that's a really great resource for people at home. Um, because I would like to encourage you to make your own smoothie or make homemade food, um, but to have tools necessary to test your food. Uh, it will reduce the anxiety of whether you're giving them the right texture of food. IDDSI.org will share with you the resources for food do's and don'ts based on the texture restriction that's been recommended by your SLP. Um, I can actually share a resource later on where I did a cooking demo for the ALS Association in Oregon and Southern Washington and showed how to use this resource. Uh, the, the acronym IDDSI is kind of a mouthful, but it's International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. And um, this is a global initiative. So all of those recommendations are being now used around the world. So we know that snacking is the number one social food. No one can deny that. Um, it is a great food to bring people together. And socialization is so important to eating and dining health. So we, I actually studied this with Dr. Samantha Shun. Um, we looked at snacks and their role in socialization in nursing homes. And some of the things that residents said, I think would be very helpful to this conversation today. Anytime anyone serves food without socialization attached to it, they, they do not have an understanding of food. They, they just don't, because that is, that is equal to or more than you know the food itself. I look forward to snacking and it's generally associated with happy times. I think that snacking is, is really good and good for a person. Snacking can be very positive and should be looked at in a positive way. So, Snacking really has another role, and that's the role of self-feeding. Um, you, there are finger foods that are in the category of snacking that promote self-feeding. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this uh, because it's a crucial part of the eating process is to be able to self-feed for as long as possible. What it does is it helps prepare for the oral phase of swallowing. So if someone has dysphagia and they can actually grab a piece of food and put it in their mouth, then that act alone can help with the swallow reflux. So it is really powerful to be able to moderate how much food you put in your mouth and to get yourself prepared for that swallow. In fact, there was a study done by Barat and another one done by Jean um, that showed that you can increase food eaten with finger foods and people ate more 
when they eat independently than when they were dependent. So we, we can kind of extend that length of time of independent eating um, with finger foods um, when there's bulbar weakness. I'm gonna talk briefly about liquid supplements um, because they are such an important asset. Uh, they, they can be supportive of a main meal, they can be consumed during snack time, and they are super convenient, right? They, they have titrated, there's so many on the market, you can really cherry pick which one you like uh, based on the protein and calories, the flavors. There's something though that I wanna share is that they're always sweet and they're always creamy. And sometimes we can get palate fatigue because the choices are so close together as far as that sweetness and that creaminess. Um, and if that's the only choice that you have to increase calories and protein um, to support that nutritional health, then after a while people can get burnt out on it. So, I met a woman actually in an ALS support group meeting in Washington. I was presenting on dining health and she came to me afterwards and told me that her husband really didn't like the supplements and was losing weight. She then decided to make her own smoothies and he loved them and his weight stabilized. I personally have started developing smoothie recipes, but I'm sure all of you can too, based on the foods that are loved and healthy. And what I've done is I've designed uh, instant soups that have added protein and real veggie powders and added fiber, and they're the right thickness for nectar thick to provide in their alternative to that sweet shake supplement. And I'm really pointing out here that there's power in having more choices to increase your dining health. So if you are inclined to make a smoothie instead of pulling out a liquid supplement, really the strength of a liquid supplement is more so in the calories and protein. And now with uh, pea protein powders, um, whey protein powders, soy protein, rice protein, there's so many different sources that if there is an allergy to one source of protein, you can usually find an alternative that can be added to a smoothie and fortify that smoothie for you at home. So I am here to show you some more ideas of snacking. Um, if you have no swallowing issues, these are typical snacks that are offered to people. Um, but when you do have swallowing issues or dysphagia, you can see some of the options on the right hand side. Um, the fruit that's on the left with no swallowing issues, of course you would mince moist or make that fruit minced and moist or you might puree it. Um, your yogurt can have fruit blended in it. Uh, a Magic Cup is a Hormel product. It's, um, so it's a 206 cookie. You can see the pictures of those on below. And make sure that those liquid supplements I mentioned before are chilled. Um, of course, not the, the, the soup option, but anytime you use a liquid supplement, if you chill it, it'll thicken it and make it easier to swallow. Uh, the, the thing that I want to draw attention to is that the options are predominantly sweet for swallowing issues. And if someone has more of a preference for savory flavors, um, this is where transitional foods come in. So everyone's probably wondering, what does that mean, tr transitional foods? Well, transitional foods is a category that you would see on that IDDSI website. Um, what they are defined as is foods that start as one texture but change into another with moisture, which in the mouth is saliva, or temperature change. There's no biting and minimal chewing is required. There's really no size restriction to the actual food itself. Um, and the there's a change in degree of transition based on the actual transitional food. If you look in the pediatric population, when um, th that's the origination of transitional foods, and I'm sure you'll recognize some of these names like Gerber, Graduate Puffs, Baby Mum Mums, Rice Puffs, Cheeto Puffs, those are all considered transitional foods. 
but adults are benefiting from this type of food because it brings finger foods to those with self-eating challenges and are difficulty swallowing. And it just brings a solution, okay, to the typical problem with a soft diet that, uh, you know, the, the, that portion of that, um, the sense of uh, texture and touch um, and auditory, the sound, those can be actually solved for with transitional foods. So it is a really powerful asset to have. It's a, it's a, a great um, thing to add to a diet to provide more choices and to really expand on the sensory enjoyment of food. If I look at transitional foods, you can see some examples down below. There is a solid foam and then there's a solid gel or liquid type of transitional foods. If we look at the gel or liquid solid state, they, um, they are more dependent on temperature change than adding more moisture to dissolve it in your mouth. I mean, the easiest thing to understand is an ice chip. An ice chip is a transitional food. Um, but when you go into solid foams, the Magic Cup, if you haven't tried it, it's frozen, but when it goes to room temperature, it turns into a pudding. And ice cream is considered a transitional food in the solid gel or liquid types. The solid foams are ones that are stable at room temperature in like their shape of a solid foam, but they transition with moisture in the mouth, um, with saliva, and also the temperature of the mouth. Um, the reason why this is powerful is because when you have dysphagia, the craving to crunch is truly a thing. When, when you ask people with dysphagia what they miss most, the answers I, I received in the study that I did were things like popcorn and pretzels and chips, and all these were crunchy snack foods. And so I spent several years looking at transitional foods, and I think that they can really benefit people with ALS. And it really is in a conversation that you should have with your SLP. I did an article recent, that was recently published in the Dysphagia Journal and uh, with my other colleagues. If you want more background information on transitional foods, this was a safety study of transitional foods showing that they can rapidly dissolve to puree in the mouth and that they don't require chewing to do so. Just tongue, moderate tongue pressure is adequate to uh, break down a transitional food in the mouth. They are also very effective for people with Parkinson's, dementia, and stroke. So, if I can just um, show here that the, there's an obvious psychosocial uh, benefit to being able to use texture and touch, really encompass the idea of finger foods with transitional foods. Um, and it reduces that isolation when you're on a specialized diet because transitional foods are foods that anyone can enjoy. Um, the real thing that you should look at is the nutritional composition because not all transitional foods are nutritionally enhanced. Um, and so, so keep that in mind. But this little diagram here just shows how the transitional food goes in the mouth, dissolves really quickly on the tongue, and then it's easier for swallowing. The, the thing about um, these transitional foods is described uh, the assets are described by several authors. Uh, they can address texture boredom, diet, liberalize the diet. That means like give more options. It really addresses the need for more person-centered care, supports eating independence, mealtime dignity of being able to self-feed, and it makes the food more attractive. This is uh, Nancy again talking now uh, about her experience with transitional foods. This does normalize life for our ALS patients because it allows them to eat even a little bit. We call that recreational PO intake. They just, just the ability to have something to swallow and be with their family and share food. This does. Sorry, I didn't. That seems to happen at the other one too. Um, 
So I loved what Nancy said there because I have heard of this as pleasure feeding as well, uh, but but to be able to eat something in a social setting is that to use your hands if you can is um, is really powerful. Let's talk a little bit more about the asset of finger foods in general uh, to improve sensory experience because there are studies that really touching a food makes the brain think it's tastier and more satis satisfying even before it reaches the mouth. Um, so just the idea of just think of those finger foods that we have when we have social gatherings. Um, they've done studies where people who really are watching their weight and have high self-control, um, they'll eat more quantity of food if they can actually touch it. Uh, so we can use this as an asset to increase nutritional intake. We can enhance independence and well-being for adults um, with cognitive impairment or with um, ALS and having neuro, a neurodegenerative condition. Um, in long-term settings. So that study there was actually used uh, specifically in long-term, but I'm finding with a lot of this research, I'm able to extrapolate some of these benefits to other population groups, such as ALS. So let's talk a little bit about making it social. Having foods that are shareable at the table is really powerful. Um, the other thing that I found with COVID and with the, the pandemic and what that brings is sometimes we can't be with our families, but if you're able to use the video software, I mean, we're using video software now for a webinar, but we can always think of things like Zoom is very popular, uh, team viewers, um, these uh, major companies are, are providing this asset so that we can have others sit at our table with us and maybe we might wanna pick the moment uh, to be one when there isn't as much fatigue, uh, there's more energy available to talk and to eat, but if other people living distant from us can eat similar foods to us and be present at the table, it's making it social, it's making a tough situation a little bit better. And Really, I would say that reducing anxiety, encouraging a slower pace of eating, um, I would say reducing anxiety for the caregiver and um, the person with um, your loved one with ALS is, is really a component to improving the or overall eating experience. I want to say that the best way that I can suggest to reduce anxiety is to know a little bit more of the texture appropriateness. Um, on a modified diet. I, I did mention the ITSI, I have it here as well. And you can learn about how to test and use, uh, test your not only your solid foods, but also your liquids. I have here um, an idea that came up in discussion with ALS Society, um, at the ALS Association here in Oregon and um, Southern Washington, we decided to make a Mexican fiesta. And it was really taking those typical Mexican party snacks and making them into easy to swallow party snacks. And we created recipes on a webinar and um, it's still on their website. Uh, you can get the free recipes here if you, um, copy and paste that into your web browser. It will have the recipe for a guacamole that I made that was really energy dense and it was the right thickness for a modified texture diet. I actually made a pina colada that had a whopping 440 calories and um, even without the rum. And, uh, and so it was really nutritious and delicious. It didn't have dairy in it. Uh, but it really carried home those flavors that we remember of a pina colada, which is really a festive drink. Um, so if you're interested in those recipes, please uh, go to that uh, site and you can download them for free. Um, and um, I look forward to making more of these recipes so that I can share, share them with you. In this instance here, what we did was we paired the guacamole with 
um, the savories black bean dip and the savories transitional crackers. The, those crackers substituted for what you see on the left, which were the tortilla chips that we um, that we all know of that uh, are used for guacamole. And they held up really well to the guacamole and of course to the black bean dip. So the other thing about that previous slide is bringing home this concept of visual models. If you are eating the same foods together and enjoying the same foods together, you're going to increase the chance of eating all of the food. So do your best to try and share a common meal. Um, there's plenty of literature out there on visual modeling. That means as you're sitting in front of someone who is eating food with you, this sharing the same food, you will increase the amount of food you eat. It actually does something positive for the conversation as well. Um, so if you, like I said, on that Zoom call, if you can get people to share and eat similar foods at the same time, it will have a positive influence for everyone on consumption of food. The idea is here is to really make foods appealing to every, everyone and um, do your best with all those other attributes, not just, um, not only transitional foods, but the smoothies, the sauces, um, the atmosphere, all of that. Um, so if I can leave you just with one message, it's this. We need to eat for nutrition, but we don't eat nutrition, we eat food. So if you are watching your loved one lose weight, the focus is, always on increasing calories and protein, but there are many meanings of food to, to food and really those meanings speak to the real reason why we eat. If we can return the conversation back to food enjoyment and the dining experience, the desire to eat can be improved. After all, like I said, there's no nutrition in food not eaten. Um, but there have to be changes made to the food and the environment because the person has changed. And so I hope that that makes sense to, to everyone here to try to keep that eating experience familiar and make what we have to change a little bit more enjoyable. So here I end um, with this, you know, this hasn't been a complete recipe. Um, but more of a convergence of ideas that relate to dining health of people with ALS. Um, I hope you all took away some ideas and uh, if you wanna learn more, please go to savories.com. It will cover more of these topics and um, there's a, a video at the bottom of the screen that can help as well um, to show how we work together um, to help people's lives with dysphagia. Thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Barwell, this is Cynthia Kanaki. Thank you so much again. You know, um, what a refreshing presentation. Your perspective of, of eating for enjoyment rather than simply counting calories. You know, so many of us count calories because we don't want to eat too many. And oftentimes with a family member diagnosed with ALS, we turn to counting calories because we want to ensure they're getting enough calories. Um, but I really enjoy your, your perspective of looking at dining or mealtime as, as a social event or something to, to really be enjoyed. We do have several comments and, and I would urge everyone, please, if you have comments or questions, please submit them in the chat box so we can share them with all the attendees. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, I just wanted to share a couple questions and comments. Question here, um, my grandfather can only eat very soft food. Can we just put the dinner the family eats into the blender and serve a blenderized dinner to him? Well, yes, of course, um, that, can, that can happen. And that is really, again, approaching the texture modification that's needed. But um, sometimes when you, if you throw, just think of all the different colors. I mean, back to our days of painting, um, you know, as a child, my daughter 
has, and Hassan have shared this with me, you're gonna get the color brown pretty quickly if you combine all the colors together. So be aware of that because that you're gonna lose out on the visual appeal. If you need to put things in blender in the blender, just keep them separate. So you know, mix your carrots separate from your meat. There's also a safety part of that too, because you really have to clean your blender well after um, blenderizing meat or um, chicken or fish. So, um, hmm. so that is uh, that. I, I hope that helps. The other idea that I have for you that's really a cool idea that I didn't bring up is you want to create volume on your plate. So if you use a piping bag, you can uh, that you, most people use for desserts, you can actually now use that for pureed food and it really transforms the plate. So if you have your carrot puree and you pipe it out, you're going to get a little bit more volume. So that initial um, you know, that number one driver that I said was the attractiveness of the food, like that maintains that a little bit longer. Great, great, valuable information. Um, not, not necessarily a question, but a comment here. I still use color coordinated placemats and napkins because it's so important to my mother-in-law. Absolutely. I, I think that um, that speaks again to um, knowing about how someone eats really tells you who they are. So if you can learn a little bit of some of those things that are really important to them, the emotional uh, component is what um, that listener was speaking to. It's going to create a sense of normalcy or, or something that is familiar and positive from their past experiences. And it's so easy to carry that forth into the future to make their present day experience more enjoyable. Excellent, excellent. And here's another comment. I'm sure this refers to the finger food segment of your presentation. It says, yes, I would rather have a big bowl of potato chips than the single serving bag portion my daughter gives me. <laughs> so you're, you're, it sounds like your points are well taken. Yes. Um, yes are we, that's, that's we are great. approaching, we're approaching the, the 60 minute um, limit of our, our webinar. Uh, but I do want to give folks another opportunity. If you have questions or comments, please take this opportunity to submit them. You can also connect directly with Dr. Volwell. You hear the um, website here. This is recorded, so you can reach out to the ALS Association or your local chapter. And this link to the recorded webinar should be available in approximately 24 hours, along with the slide deck, the PowerPoint slide deck, that Dr. Barwell shared with us today. Um, quick recap for any additional questions. Very well then, thank you again so much everyone for carving time out of your day. Please remember to stay safe wherever you are and we look forward to having you join us again next month for another presentation for practical information related to respiratory challenges in ALS. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon and have a good day. Thank you.